Lights, camera, 12 sting operations, and one TV presenter? Well, how? Together, they were able to nab more than 200 men who were willing to go to any lengths necessary to feed their filthy desires. But one show came down heavy on them, prepared to stop those menaces and expose the truth. Despite the raging success in the 2000s, TCAP met its end. And here's a look at some of the creeps that had a big role to play in the show being canceled. But before that, here's a look at the show's main objective straight from the horse's mouth. One story goes out in a hundred different directions. And so, right. you know, people um, become aware of a situation. Oh yeah, I mean, there's no doubt you that know? you make, made a difference. Yep, all they wanted to do was make an example out of these kind of people to instill fear in any others who dare try the same feat. But in an interview, Chris has finally revealed the reason behind the show being canceled. But does he agree with the network to call off the show? I mean, I know better, you know better, the police know better. Okay, got it. And well, I guess as viewers, we know better too. Although production was abruptly put to a halt, Chris didn't let it get to him. Now, ultimately, NBC made the decision not to do new production. He continued the passion of trying to put these creeps behind bars by coming up with his own version of the show, which he continues to stream on True Blue. Can't say the man isn't dedicated. But then came an important question. Was the episode called off because of the one incident where a certain up-and-coming creep took his own life? Well, Chris cleared the air. And I'm not saying the suicide had nothing to do with it. I'm sure there were considerations about, okay, if this could happen, what could happen next? Yes, while he did agree that Louis Condrat episode and the lawsuit that followed did have a negative impact on the show, he decided to let us in on a little inside information all the same. A lot of material that could be repackaged, repurposed, and re-aired for many years to come. Turns out, the network decided to take a step back to cut the expenses of shooting a new episode altogether. Since they already had enough material on them, NBC decided to make a tactical move to reap profits without the effort. Or at least that's what Chris had to share in the interview. Getting ratings and attention and generating profits. Whether you believe it or not, the coincidence was too much to ignore. Let's not forget the show also faced a series of defamation charges and charges for wrongful accusation from many creeps who were caught on the show. It was a daily battle for the production house, making trips between the sting house and the courtroom. And nobody likes that kind of drama. As for Chris, here's what he had to say about the show being canceled. I thought we could go do more. I was ready to do some other topics at the time, quite honestly. I was attached to it. Well, it's not hard to understand why. Imagine spending days and days, and I'm talking 16 to 18 hours every day, on the set of the sting house waiting for a new creep to show up. Also, don't forget that most of these creeps show up at really odd hours of the day. Midnight, 2 a.m., 4 a.m., you name it. And Chris was always there to receive them. So I hate to be the bearer of bad news. So it must have come as a shock to him to know that the show wouldn't air anymore. But hey, he didn't let that stop him. Chris decided to keep the fight against these creeps going, which is why he teamed up with an entirely different group and came up with the show Takedown with Chris. Now, I've been hooked into the show myself as of late, and I'll definitely be giving you guys a glimpse into Chris's new venture in my upcoming video. But for now, let's take a stroll down memory lane and take a look at some of the creeps, aside from the district attorney case, that might have led to the cancellation of the show. Show. And one of the top contenders on this list is this dude right here. Under the guise of Special Guy 29, John Kennelly decided to walk in buck naked when he showed up at the Sting House. Caught red-handed with nothing but his socks on, the dude was stumped when Chris walked into the room. I guess you could say he knocked his socks off. Anyway, bad joke aside. After being lured into a chat by one of the setups, Kennelly was caught trying to have questionable relations with an unsuspecting boy. The chats that led him to come to the trap were truly horrifying to see. Despite knowing the age difference between him and the setup, who he believed was at least half of his age, Kennelly made his way to the house under surveillance not knowing what was about to happen. Now, if his chats and intentions weren't dirty enough, what happened when he actually showed up was even more telling. During during the chat exchange, there seemed to have transpired a joke of sorts, but Kennelly was so blinded by his urges that he took the request in a literal sense. Turns out the setup made a rather bizarre request to Kennelly by asking to show up in just his birthday suit. If you thought that was absurd, Kennelly's reaction was disturbing. Kennelly openly shared his interest and was willing to show up in 
his natural form without a single fabric on his body just to please the setup, with no idea that each and every conversation was being recorded. Kennelly arrived at the house and headed straight to the garage. Wondering why? Well, it was so that he could go forward with his plan to make his special appearance. Now, the crew had no idea that the dude would actually go through with the plan, and as he started to drop one piece of garment on the floor after another, everyone was left peering their eyes out of the scene that unfolded before him. None of them actually believed that Kennelly would show up the way he did. And we really didn't think he was going to do it. Uh, this was our second investigation, and while we'd seen some surprising things, you know, who's going to walk into a stranger's house naked? Well, what's more, the dude seemed to be carrying a huge bag with various items that he had brought to woo the setup. And once he made his grand entry, he placed the bag on the kitchen counter and took a seat by the counter. Kennelly then patiently proceeded to wait for his date in silence as Chris decided to cut in. Now, any normal person would be startled by the sound of boots walking in on him. But Kennelly had so many things on his mind that he didn't even notice Chris pulling up behind him. Only when Chris broke the silence with his hard-hitting greeting did Kennelly notice that he'd been busted. Could you explain yourself? I'm sorry. Shocked to see Chris, a flustered Kennelly was handed a towel in order to cover himself before getting started with the confrontation. The circumstances weren't already uncomfortable enough. Kennelly surprisingly seemed pretty apologetic for his action. Kennelly had no idea who Chris was, and the only thought that ran through his mind was the possibility of Chris being the setup's father. Yes, your son I am to me. And he told me to come on over. Unfortunately, it was worse. But Chris didn't let him in on the investigation as of yet. He decided to play along and ask him more about this situation where his son had texted Kennelly to come over buck naked. Kennelly at first tried to beat around the bush, but when Chris continued to grill him, he came clean. What would have happened, John, if I wasn't here? I probably would have chickened out, sir. Chicken out. The dude revealed that he was 29 years old and worked as a school bus driver. Not only had he lied about his age in the chats, but the discovery of his profession involving the handling of children was something the crew couldn't shrug off. But wait, turns out Kenley was trying to deceive Chris. Who would have thought, right? What do you think should happen to you? I don't know, sir. Sometime later, it was found out that Kennelly wasn't a driver, but a teacher. This made the situation even worse. But wait, there were more surprises in store because in truth, the dude was actually unemployed. Gosh, my head is spinning. But the drama is far from being over. Turns out Kennelly didn't learn a lesson from the first thing. Couldn't believe it, but it was the same screen name, same everything. So the decoy made a date. He showed up once again and was caught for a second time while grabbing a meal for his next visit at McDonald's. Can't say the man wasn't on a mission. Sean, we've been through this before. What are you doing? But how could his boss contribute to the cancellation of the show? Turns out the crew came under heavy fire for allegedly luring Kenley. The production was blamed for putting thoughts into people's heads when they wouldn't have initially gone through with it. Now, you can probably see how flawed this whole accusation is, but, well, it is what it is. But the real trouble came when the crew started landing some prominent figures in the chat room, like this dude right here. This guy was a prominent member of society. Just like Kennelly, this dude also had no idea that he walked into an obvious trap. Now, while Kennelly decided to show up the way he did, David Kay, on the other hand, decided to give the setup a little glimpse of himself before he actually showed up. Yep, the pictures he shared with the setup were downright disgusting. And what's more, it wasn't just him. It was a bunch of others busy in the act. Despite knowing the consequences and even mentioning it in the chat, the man was unable to hold in his desire and showed up to set his plans in motion, just like all those that came before and after him. So the man arrived in his car and proceeded to make his way into the house that he had been called to. With full confidence, this 54-year-old walked into the kitchen like he owned the place. Hello? Hi. Hey, hold on a second. I gotta change my shirt. Yeah. 
The man continued to have a conversation with his date talking from behind the doors. That's when Chris decided to put this brace on this happening little party. The dude was left speechless, but what happened next was shocking. When the man revealed his occupation, everybody's jaws practically dropped the floor. Now imagine, if a rabbi has to come under such questionable circumstances, then what else can you expect from others? At first, David took his time to assess the situation, and once he was done, his personality completely transformed from the guy who was all smiles to someone who couldn't stop frowning. But his true character came out onto the surface when the cameraman decided to zoom in on his face. David lost it. Computer predators. Oh no. Come on. Yep, this episode was an eye-opener in more ways than one. For one, the crew were shocked to find a so-called holy man make his way to the house with absolutely no hesitation. And secondly, they understood the risk of handling creeps head-on. See, handling guys like David can be unpredictable. While yes, the cops were waiting right outside the door, anything could realistically happen during the confrontation. Who knows, they could even pull a knife on Chris or try to fight him like David did. Don't, don't, you don't want, you don't want to touch anybody. You don't want it. Additionally, the show came under serious scrutiny after going for someone as powerful as David. More than worrying about their rabbi, many people jumped in to defend the man and throw the show under the bus. Well, sadly, that's the nature of the beast, right? But then came this man, who not only blew things out of proportion with not only showing up completely exposed, but also with some pretty bizarre fantasy. So this dude was about as Kennelly and the rabbi put together. Double the trouble. He decided to walk in like Kennelly, and as soon as he sensed that the setup was interested in more, he dropped some nasty pictures of himself like the rabbi. The decoy says, come on in, I'm just going to do something real quick and I'll come out. And she comes into the room where I'm at. But wait, this dude was worse. He wanted to go through with the act in all the rooms and even proposed a plan to rope in her other friend. If that wasn't enough, the dude also threw in a random request of including her pet cat in the act. I wish I was it. Marvin, you're naked. Yeah, I wouldn't have gone all the way. I wasn't... You, know, you, were, you went all the way when you took your clothes off, just about. But the story doesn't end there. Once he was busted, when Chris asked him what would have happened if the setup had been in the house, Marvin admitted that he would have gone through with his plan of going all the way. When Chris tried to drill some sense into him, the dude simply brushed off all the allegation and claimed that he was just messing around. Police on the ground! Well, of course, he was caught and handed over to the cops, but this sting not only exposed nasty intentions with the setup, but also with animal. Remember when I said this guy was double trouble? But the crew got in double trouble themselves, once again with the so-called luring argument. Really? I mean, just because you saw a dude into cats, are you really gonna try it now? Well, that's what some people believe, that the show was glorifying this kind of behavior. Now, I'm not buying into that nonsense, but well, the sayers always have a say. And now, coming to the episode we started with, the one that eventually put the nail in Teacap's coffin. Prosecutor for more than 20 years knocks on the door. So the man in question is Louis William Condrat Jr., who was a Texas assistant district attorney. It's a mystery even to this day that a man with such a reputation would stoop this low, especially since the man had been dealing with criminals for the entirety of his career. Well, he had an added advantage, you see. He knew how to stay clear of trouble until he landed in a chat room where the crew was fishing for Creed. Assistant district attorney for Coffin County. Oh, what makes you say that, Sam? Because we trace it back to his MySpace. The setup managed to keep Condrat busy while a hired actor kept up the act over the phone. The chats went on for about two weeks and within this time, Kondrat made a contact at least every day with the setup across several phone calls. The prosecutor then sent pictures of youngsters in the act to teach the setup a lesson or two before actually engaging in the real thing themselves. Ear yes. It looks huge. When the setup asked Kondrat to meet, the dude got a whiff of doubt and bailed out. What followed next was totally unpredictable. At first, Kondrat went off the radar, even going so far as to delete his online account. However, by the time Kondrat had bailed, the police were already ready with an arrest warrant for him. It was time for them to head out and make the arrest. The cops surrounded Kondrat's place and were making a move to get inside when Kondrat tried to ignore their attempt. 
However, Conrad's personal devices were still turned on. Looks like the cops are going to have to make a break in. The police managed to get inside and there was radio silence for the next five minutes. And the next thing you know, Lieutenant Edna Barber walked out of the building to explain what had happened. Tensions were running high. Had Conrad managed to flee the scene? As they made entry, they confronted the suspect. I believe he's in the hallway and he told them he wasn't gonna hurt them and then shot himself in the head. Well, the lieutenant put an end to all doubt. Barber informed Chris and his crew that the SWAT team had successfully infiltrated the building, and by the time they had reached the hall, they met Kondrat, who was in clear distress. But here's the most important thing. He was carrying a firearm. Although he assured the officers that he wouldn't hurt any of them, the same couldn't be said about himself. And he had a pistol in his hand. Small caliber. Yes, the dude pulled the trigger and put an abrupt end to his own life. But guess what? This decision of his ended in a huge public outcry where people rallied to fight for him. The local community accused the cops for invading privacy and for being the sole cause of Conrad's passing. But that was never part of the plan. The crew and the cops were just as taken back as the locals. It was Conrad's call to make. But the narrative made a drastic shift as Patricia Conrad, his sister, filed a lawsuit against Dateline NBC for more than a pretty penny. And the rest is history, I guess. And I intend to fight as hard and as long as I can can to prevent other people from becoming victims of such reckless actions. While the TCAP community largely points towards the incident for putting a premature end to the show, the producers have refused time and time again to give the Conrad story any credit for that. So now that you know the inside of story of what went down, why do you think the show was canceled? Do you think NBC chickened out or did they have a genuine reason? Don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments below or you could also leave me a DM over on my social media pages. And if you enjoyed this video, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. And before you leave, make sure to check out this next video right here. It's even better.